Hey guys, Jack here. Do some little garden updates for you today. Just some stuff that's going on. This first thing, no big deal, but it's really kind of cool to look at because you understand more about the biology of plants when you see something like this happen. This is red basil. It's really more like a purple basil. It's a beautiful plant. And it produces this deep purple, almost opal leaves. And you can see that it's, it's doing that right now. But if you look down here, see how they're all green and just kind of flushed out? Now you might think that's because that plant was unhealthy and all of a sudden it's getting healthy. That's not the case. We'll go over here to another clump of it and you can see it doing the same thing. So what's going on? This is actually showing you the reason this plant developed this pigment in the first place. It's been hot as blazes. It's Texas in the summer. Basil is a Mediterranean herb. Uh, it can handle heat, but any plant that starts in a place with heat will sort of kind of mutate and move out naturally hybridize and develop characteristics and move as far into northern climates as it can over time this is an adaptation for less sun less heat so if you think about it, if you wanted to make something really hot and you painted one of one piece of metal green light green and you painted another piece of metal black and you set them in the sun it wouldn't take a genius to figure out when you come back and measure the surface temperature that the one of them that's black is going to be hotter well, that works the same way with dark purple. Any dark red, dark color will pull more heat and warm the leaves and create more solar activity. You notice most solar panels are not white. They're not reflective, right? Dark colors tend to pull in uh, solar energy, and light colors tend to somewhat bounce it back. So all you're seeing is, is our, our climate has shifted. Look at the sky. It's gray. Here come the airplanes, right? Everything is different. We are, we had, I think yesterday was the 21st. If yesterday was the 21st, if I'm right, we just had our fall equinox. We had our first day of fall. And for like the last couple weeks, it's like the plants know that things are changing, right? And so all of a sudden they do this. And it, again, it's not, it's not a health issue. Look at this giant thing over here. This is red perilla. And that's what you expect red perilla to look like. And the reason I let this plant get stupid is I wanted to... Red perilla seed is actually very expensive. A lot of people that grow microgreens grow this, and uh, they spend a lot of money on seed. It's also a very expensive microgreen. Sushi chefs use it. Um, I don't actually care for it very much as this kind of large plant. Uh, I've been told it's better cooked uh, than it is raw. It has kind of an anise weird flavor that I don't care for, but a lot of people love it. But it has very pretty little pink flowers. And it's just now going to seed. And this is one. That's one seed. And they're tiny. Like they are like half the size of a mustard seed. Maybe, maybe a quarter of the size of a mustard seed. And just look at what this has turned into. But if you look there, what color are those leaves? Green. It's all the new growth. As we've dropped the solar activity, we've dropped the intense heat. We've it's overgrown this poor pepper plant here. And I've never grown this until this year, other than as a microgreen. And I, I just want to know how much seed can we make? Because I think we're going to make seed. If you look now, it, it's, 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 I actually think it's actually in the mint family. And it puts seed on a lot like mint or maybe even more like basil does. So we'll see. But I think we'll get plenty. And this is a plant that I wouldn't mind if it was growing in between trees in my swales. So if nothing else, I can make John Dowie cry and throw a whole bunch of perilla seed out of my swales and let it grow wild, native. Uh, lemon basil's doing good. Cucumber's miserable. <laughs> uh, that's probably from cucumber mosaic virus. It's spread by cucumber beetles. The cucumber beetles don't actually damage your, your plants very much, but they transmit the mosaic virus and it's what it does to your cucumber leaves and i'm just not worried about it i got brand and but here's the funny thing again once the weather changes and the plant's not stressed look at the new growth nice bright green i'm leaving it i don't need the space i'm getting ready to transition into winter gardening here pretty soon we'll just see what happens because we got a happy little experiment when we did that with the trombuchino squash by the way didn't we um but that looks bad now the good news is i will have one more crop of cucumber because i have cucumber in the greenhouse uh, in the aquaponic system. I'll probably have more cucumbers than I know what to do with. Um, my plan is to have them for salad for the workshop in November. 
anyway everything else is just look at the eggplant like this eggplant if you saw some of the older videos that leaf down there just needs to come off not enough sun down there is there um they were not looking happy they love this cooler weather and when i say cooler weather we'll still get days in the 90s but they won't be 90 degrees all day and we'll have a lot of days where we don't even come out of the 80s and we actually stay in the low 80s and we'll have some days where we stay down in the 70s and these plants all love this that's pickerel rush i'll show you what it's doing here in a minute it's 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 cut though i'll talk about those beans back there in a minute when we get around the back side Little sprigs of ginger coming up. That didn't work out well this year. I have a better plan for it next year. That was my first year to try that. So here's why the pickerel rush is here. I took my uh, my trusty little $9 rice knife, which is one of the greatest tools ever invented. Thousands of years old, still works as good as the day it was invented. And I pruned back this pickerel rush. I usually wait till winter to do that. And I'll, I'll prune this way, way back. It grows in these little, I'll show you over here. It just basically sends out these chromes, is what they're referred to like this. And that right there, if I plant that, that'll make a, a brand new plant, no problem. But I don't need any more of it. So I'll prune it all back because it's actually in one fairly small pot. It doesn't need soil. It'll send those out in the water. And this gets big every year. And it's a lot of place for little small fish to hide. And that's why I like to give them a full summer into fall into winter till they get a little bit of size on them before I start taking it away. Uh, that way the predator fish are a little less active when the water's cooler. They've kind of sharpened and honed their escape skills and stuff like that. Uh, and they found other places to hide. But especially when they're itty bitty tiny, uh, you know, even their bigger brothers that were born earlier in the year will eat them. So I like to give them that hiding space. The thing is, I've never had this dwarf. I've got a beautiful kind of it's not a dwarf it's a small variety of lily pad over there they get about that big versus if you look here like see what i'm saying they, these get about uh two-thirds the size of those do the pads and that one's produced some beautiful yellow lilies for me i've never had this one produce a flower yet it was planted last spring it grew okay uh i guess it was an itty bitty little little chrome when they sent it to me and it needed some time to mature it looks kind of scraggly uh, it got overwhelmed by the other floating vegetation. And I just found this morning, that was a lily bud, and it is just mush. What happened was it just got enveloped by the water lettuce. So it died, but look it right there. Look it right there. Ain't that cool? Brand new one. This probably needs, I have these little spikes that you stick in for fertilizing water lilies, and it probably needs them. Um... But I'll tell you what, I think it's going to really blow up here for the last part of fall. Uh, water lilies actually like the water a little cooler, believe it or not. They really do. Uh, and and it, in fact, it would probably make sense for me to take that. That's a 14-gallon concrete mixing tray. They're 7 bucks at Home Depot and Lowe's. They're one of the greatest aquatic planters I've ever found. The corners are rounded. That way, when the roots get there, they kind of wrap instead of like if you have a square container they can kind of bind up uh, they're cheap they last damn near forever and uh, readily available and water lilies though actually like to be in about two to three foot of water and this water here is only about four and a half foot deep total when the water's at its highest point it's probably down to the soil line there 10 inches from the surface and it would probably make a lot of sense for me to take it out and take one layer of those cinder blocks. They're on cinder block towers out, put the tile back on because there's like a little tile bench there that it's sitting on, and then put it back in deeper. I don't want to do that. I want to do it, but I don't want to do it. And I'll tell you why I don't want to do it. This has become breeding ground for my green sunfish that are in here. And this year, I've seen dozens and dozens which means there's probably hundreds of itty bitty little sunfish in there and i wasn't sure basically what i have in here are red ear sunfish the shell crackers and green sunfish and i wasn't sure which one they were i was able to dip some out the other night they're definitely little greens that is a great pan fish to eat and they're breeding in these so much so that i already put another one of these over there and i had a water poppy in a small pot and I left it in the pot and I kind of put it to the side and I filled it all with lava rock. They like laying eggs in that lava rock. 
if I they would prefer like a sand or a dirt but what I've learned in this type of environment if you fill a, a thing like this with sand or dirt when they come in there and mess with it, they throw it all out and it ends up empty I've got one over there I need to redo uh, this year and I'm thinking pea gravel might be another option because it'd be harder for them to excavate that uh, but I filled it with uh, with with basically compost and it a small top layer of rock and they wallow because I was growing Valsneria in there, which is an aquarium grass that I thought would be great. And they wallowed it all out and killed most of it. Uh, but with the lava rock, I guess they settle for it as a place to breed. There's one of my big, oh, he just left one of my big kois. It's my big platinum koi right there. That fish is probably three, nah, two pounds right now. Anyway, um, I'm just looking forward to this producing some blossoms for me. Over here, remember I talked about how tough these Trombachino squashes were? Look at that. I put that log underneath it. I guess you can't see it because I have that. Yeah, you can see there's a lot of this. I put that rotted log underneath it to keep it up out of the dirt so it wouldn't start to rot or get in rot. I want to see how big it'll get. Here's another one here. And they're called Trombachino zucchini. But these are basically a long neck pumpkin. Uh, this is a, a Cucuberta machota uh, species. And they can, it's not that vine borers won't go after them they can survive with vine borers in them and as i showed you before i mean these guys there's one this actually that that squash over there is on this vine right here um you can see right here not only do they have vine borers in them, they have vine borers in them right now that's that's material being excavated by the vine borers and these i'm not saying they never die but many of them survive and what i'm going to do is i'm going to save seed from my toughest survivors this year which is a good practice anyway and definitely i'm gonna save seed from this plant the squash i don't know if you guys can tell how big this thing is but there's some scale on it i cannot get my hand around it right there and i have fairly large hands i mean my fingers aren't even, i don't know if i can get the camera where you can see here right. <laughs> there's a good almost three inches between my fingertips trying to reach around it. And like I said, it ain't done growing yet. I wish it would have, um, you know, started higher up where it could have had longer to grow. Once they hit ground, they'll start to bend like that. Um, I'm gonna wait till it starts to turn a little bit orange. Once they start to turn a little bit orange, you can go ahead and pick them and they'll go ahead and fully turn orange and the skin will cure hard like a winter squash on their own. And they're just not gonna grow anymore. Once they start to turn that orange color, they're done. Um, but man, that, that one is nice. This one here ain't bad neither. I can just barely touch my fingers around that one. See, so that's up here. I'd say that thing is two and a half foot at least already. This has just been a great find this year. I've grown them before, but I've always used them as zucchinis. I've never grown them out to large plants and I've, and I've always, every year, when the squash buggers and the vine borers made them really looking miserable in midsummer, I've just ripped them out. I, ha I haven't, and this year I just decided, you know what? Let's just leave them in and see what happens. And you can see what I'm talking about. Between the borers and the bugs, they've stripped that vine. And you can see up top there, I don't know if you can see it, but right there, there's just material drilled out. And that vine is right there across the top. And it's already produced two squashes for me that I've already harvested. Um, I harvested both of those green to use them for zucchini noodles. They make the best zucchini noodles you'll ever make because you've got this straight neck and there's no seeds in there. That's all material. But these two will be storage squashes for the winter. And that same vine, okay, now it's a different branch, but that same plant, it is in the ground right there and you can see it's eight up it's just eight up with vine borers you can see it's this miserable little vine here right but you see that vines from squash will root if you bury them so i dug a trench so there's that vine right there from here to here i dug a trench put that down in there threw some doctor earth fertilizer on it threw a couple of the, uh, some of the water lettuce on it put the dirt back on top of it and coated it it was piled up that high with uh with the water lettuce and then once that went down i keep throwing it on there to keep it hydrated and keep it fed and it don't look real happy here well it can't get no sun look at this dun, dun, dun. it is re 
I mean, it's just going. New tips on it, grow, and there you go, two more of them. Now, I don't know that they'll ever get as big as those two over there, but, you know, those are great for harvesting right now. Honestly, those would make good zucchini noodles, and they would just make a good chopped up sautéed squash. I will say once they get any bigger than that, even if they're still green, you want to peel them. The peel gets really hard on them. The good news is, even when they're huge and orange, a, a basic peeler, they're not like a butternut where it's really hard to peel them. They peel easily even when they're large. They don't store as long as a butternut. They'll store for about three or four months, and then they start to get pithy. But that's, that's a great amount of storage without doing any work. Just cut it, keep it somewhere with good air circulation, and they'll store, you know, if you, if you harvest your last ones in, say, October... Four months, November, December, January, Feb so you're until the end of February. And I have I would say maybe you could push five months before you really, you'll, you'll, you'll still eat it, but you'll be like, well, it would have been better if I ate it a month ago. But that's a hell of a storage crop coupled with sweet potato, which we have a little bit of sweet. We have sweet potato everywhere, but this is kind of our sweet potato patch this year. And it's just gone bonkers. I mean, absolutely flipping bonkers. And I want to kind of show you some other things that have kind of got their second wind as, as the weather has changed. This is, everybody thinks Texas is easy. Texas is hard because we have two, two darths, right? Two times a year where everything wants to die. We have when it actually freezes in the winter, and that can happen in October, or it can maybe not happen until January. And you don't know. It changes every year. And... We have our summer, which is guaranteed, at least by mid-June, to be miserable. And all the way up until the end of August and into September, the first week of September, the plants just want to die because it's 100,000 degrees out. And if you live in a place like I do, unless you have raised beds like this, the soil is only about that deep before you hit rock. But everything just knows. This is my time. I have got to grow now. See that? That's Seminole Pumpkin. That's another cucurbita machota. And it's almost to the end down there. It, Gen Genesis is right here. So that's about four foot. And the back of this bed is 12 foot long. And it's about a foot short of the end. So that makes what, 11 and four, that's what, 15 foot that vine is. And two, three weeks ago, it was to here. All of that is in two to three weeks. Now it's, it's not put out multiple, well actually it has. Here's another one here. That's new. When the hell did that happen? So it's got another vine. Now, I can tell you that it doesn't look happy at the end. You know what happened? A duck ate the end off of it. What it'll do, if I tuck it under there so it's not tempting, it'll, uh, because it's been pruned off, it'll sprout out another tip and it'll go. And we might get it up onto here before the year end. I don't know if it'll produce, but who cares? All right, more. Butternut. Sad looking little butternut. This thing, I can't believe it's alive. It got hammered with vine borers. Now, again, it's a mochetta, which they can usually survive that, but it got completely obliterated with squash bugs. Every leaf on it looked like that. And that's what squash bugs do. They get underneath the bottom and they suck all the juice out of the leaf. And uh, so I was like, again, I should pull it out. It ain't doing nothing. Let it alone. Look at the new growth on it. And look down here. Brand new butternut. And I know that one's going to produce because I got myself a male blossom. And it was just, pollen was just falling off it. And you peel it back and you, just like this. When I say manually pollinate squash, that's what I'm talking about. So that's butternut to butternut. So I know it's a true pollination. So if I save seed from that one, you know, I got my honey badger squash. I got a little, little sad butternut here, but it's, it's doing okay. It might make a nice little, I don't think it's going to get very big. But it might make a nice little, uh, little snack squash. Some other things going on. They aren't happy. A lot of this is, this is honeydew melon. And it's a cucumber species too. It's closer to like a cucumber than it is to like a squash though. And it, all its new growth down here is looking a little bit better, but it doesn't look that great. But you know what? Sucker is producing. Look, two honeydews there. Honeydew mill in there. I know there's some more somewhere else. Um, there's a bunch on that I'm not sure if they're going to set or not. Like there's one there, and there's dozens of these. 
I'd say about one in one in a, about 10 set. And uh, so we'll see what else sets. For all I know, there's probably some hidden because it's all grown through here. This is sorrel. And this is really good in the spring when they're big leaves like this. They're not that great. Ducks like them and chickens like them. So I'll cut some for them once in a while. But I saved it for seed. And it's just common sorrel. And this is my belief. Sow seed every day. Just a little bit here, a little bit there every day. Nature will figure out what to do. Swiss chard. This was all miserable looking. Oh, look, there's a... There's a melon. I don't think that'll set, but there's a little melon. Uh, so this is four, four hork giant. This is like my favorite squash to grow. Look how beautiful those leaves are. That plant was miserable. Uh, I, what I do is I cut a lot of the miserable leaves like this off, and I'll give them to the chickens, and we'll eat it whenever we want to. This is going to have a good run through fall, and it's a biannual. So in its second year, it generally will go to seed and die, uh, but that's fine. There'll be new stuff by then. But what I learned this year, and I have other videos about it, it is it, the preferred place for little hairy jumper spiders. And they're like the biggest of the jumper spiders are like that big. They look like little mini tarantulas. They love to live in this stuff. So I stopped taking it out when it looks like this. I'll let pests go ahead and have at it. Shard's actually a member of the beet family, though the root's not very useful. But that root is up out of the thing like the root top is actually up here now it's growing like this big stem if i cut that back it will flush with a new flush of leaves and sometimes you can even get three years out of them uh, but i usually go ahead and call it after that and what i'll do eventually is i'll go down and i'll cut that root at the soil line all the way down at the bottom and leave that root to rot kind of like you use uh, radish as a uh, cover crop uh, to rot off in the soil another ford hork giant and again, all the new growth looks beautiful, and it's chicken feed or it's human feed, depending on what you want to do. But that's all coming back around. This is uh, red chicory, but it's marketed as red dandelion. And it's really, it's also a spring crop when it's young, because it's kind of bitter right now. But you can imagine that in a salad. And these are still okay. A couple of these in your salad, as bitter as they are when they're mixed with other greens, it's actually kind of nice. Uh, but really, it's, it's past. Just like dandelion, you want to eat it young. Um, I let it go. I let it go to seed. I got seed off it. And I, I'm just going to... I'll decide when I want to get rid of it. Right now, it's occupying space. And if it's occupying space, a weed's not growing. That's, if you want something to... If you don't want weeds, put something where the weed would grow and grow that thing instead. Uh, this is... Um, God, what the hell is this called now? I can't remember. Uh, was was Aunt Lay? I don't, this is, it's a relative of lamb's quarters. It's basically Mexican lamb's quarters. And for some reason, I can't re remember the name of it right now. My people's Aunt Lay. Um, but generally, you eat the seed heads when they're young. And seed for this stuff is expensive. And I'm going to have, oh, I don't know, half a gallon of seed off of this thing. And I'm just letting it go. And you can see finally... It's a very, it takes a very long time for the seed to cure. And it's finally starting to go brown. And it almost needs to look black before you harvest it. Um, some dill that's going, or not dill, this is some fennel that's going to seed. I just wanted to see what I can get out. It's actually a hybrid fennel. And um, generally they say not to save the seed of hybrids. I found that to be not true. Often saving the seed of hybrids creates new hybrids and new generational plants and new heirlooms. Especially if you keep replanting it. We'll see how that goes with this. My concern is this one doesn't actually seem to be setting seed. And that could be because of the hybrid variety is that it's just a sterile variety. But eh, we'll let it go a little longer. It ain't hurting nothing. Um, pepper, back to the perilla. So that's where we are with things. I'll just to show you over here, the peppers are banging. This is what happens when you use Dr. Earth on your peppers and you do a late season feed. Look at the, the, the depth of the green. Setting peppers everywhere, jalapenos there. These are jalapeno M. These don't get real big. These are your your smaller, hotter jalapenos. They're good for salsas and stuff like that. I got some of the big jumbos in the aviary. But look at these Cuban owls. I mean, this is a big plant. These went in late too. These were not optimally planted. These were like some extra plants. I'm thinking about going to pepper cages next year because I mean, that's this plant, and it's living with that plant. And 
they're traditionally picked at this green stage and uses the frying pepper, and they're good like that. But they're better like that right there. And if you give that that one two more days, it'll be deep, bright red. And they are the sweetest damn pepper. They go from this uh, kind of a typical frying banana pepper like flavor. Uh, it's good fried, but it, you know it is what it is. To like sweeter than any bell pepper you can ever get if you let them change color. We got. <clears throat> Asian eggplant back in there again. I'm not growing anywhere near as many eggplants next year. So that's that's what's going on, guys. It's uh it's late in the season. I didn't actually work this garden very hard this year. Got peppers in the back there. I just threw stuff in and let it go because it was its first year. And all I was really concerned with doing is building up the soil nutrition, making sure it was there was roots down in it and what have you. But what this all tells me. And what I've learned is going to make next year unbelievable with production. Next year, I will have a diagram of what every, everything that's getting planted, at least all the main plants, maybe some interspersed herbs and stuff, but as far as the main plants, quantities and where they go and what have you. And that's all by being a part of things. That's a permaculture principle. There's a bunch of different ways different permaculturists have expressed it. You know, interact and accept feedback right that's another way that people have explained it and i know now certain things i know how well this squash does i know when to plant it as early as possible i know to let it go through the dark i know to not worry about it i also know to plan when i do it instead of just getting it up vertical i'm going to plant it next year along these back lines like let's say i'll plant one there and i'll train that vine along the ground I'll train that vine along the ground and I'll bury it in two or three places. And when it shoots a new vine up, then I'll train that vine vertical and have multiple roots and get it all the way over to here because I know it'll grow like that. And I know it, it, it gets really happy when you grow it with beans. So there's my Asian long beans. I learned this year that my favorite bean to grow, Scarlet Runner, still hates it here. It still hates it. It gets uh, leaf, uh, what do you, like rust. Is a, is a disease that beans get. I know these guys don't get it. So next year, instead of planting these late and scarlets early, I'll plant them together and there's a scarlet coming back. I'll get some beans, but I know if I want a big green bean type crop to go with Asian long beans. I've accepted the feedback. Nature has told me, hey dummy, if you want to grow something here, this is what to grow. Look at those. Man, those are up. And that's what I did today. I went by, a lot of them are kind of flopped out. And I went and pulled all the runners and got them up on the wire so that they're, and it's, it's, it's interesting. These plants, you know, they don't have the sentience of a human being, but they have some, some level of intelligence in them, some sort of innate intelligence nature has. And as soon as one thing touches something like that, like a trellis, and that bean wraps around it, as it keeps sending out new tendrils, it's going to run. They're going to head mostly back there because it knows it's found a place that it can tendrilize. Anyway... I got to go, guys. Take care. We'll catch up with you later.